Uh, so I'll post the quiz after we do this lesson and we take a bit of time to review, Leo. Okay, welcome to lesson eight. Uh, today's, or this final lesson for the day, we are looking at enzymes. We're gonna kind of bring in all together the stuff that we learned about functional groups, all the things we've learned about proteins, uh, and we're gonna put them all together to learn about enzymes and how they work to break down carbohydrates, uh, fats, as well as perform other functions within the cell and within living organisms. So enzymes are what's called 3D proteins, right? That 3D protein we're looking at is that primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures all coming together to form a functional protein. And in this case, it's that functional 3D protein molecule that can help speed up chemical reactions in living things. Again, I, I, sound like, I might sound like a broken record when I allude to the idea that without these things, we would not be able to live. But the key thing here is that it, it breaks down, uh, it works as a catalyst to break down molecules. And that way we can reuse these enzymes to help with chemical reactions to make sure that we have the necessary uh, fuels, the necessary uh, access to resources to ensure that the cellular life can continue. Because without enzymes, most reactions would happen quite slowly, uh, so much so that it would not be able to keep us alive. The amount of energy that we need to uh, talk, the amount of energy we need to do an online class in uh, is quite high. And the natural breakdown of those molecules would take too long if it did happen without enzymes. So these enzymes help to speed up. Uh, but recall, it's not a reactant or a product uh, because at the end of the day, it's working as a means to break down a reactant into a product. So it does not get used up in that chemical equation, it does not get used up during the reaction. An enzyme helps to facilitate that reaction. Okay, so that's an important uh, thing to recall. It is not a reactant or a product. It is used to facilitate that reaction and speed it up. So activation energy uh, looks at every chemical reaction and it says, okay, if every chemical reaction needs that activation energy, the amount of energy to get started, uh, the activation energy breaks those bonds of the reactants. So if enzymes are meant to speed things up, it's gonna work by lowering the activation energy and it makes it easier to start that reaction. So in order to have that chemical reaction happen, we need to have the enzyme lower that activation energy to allow for it to speed it up. So the presence of an enzyme drastically reduces the activation energy needed to start that reaction. So when we look at this chart, if this is my energy or activation energy, here's without an enzyme and here's with an enzyme, I'll use a different color. It's this huge, 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 huge drop in amount of energy required. Uh, so it makes those reactions more efficient. It needs less energy input into the reaction, and it has a higher rate of reaction. So ultimately, those three things uh, work, uh, that enzymes do, work to making the uh, breakdown of those chemical reactions more efficient, speedier, and it helps to save some energy. So there's a couple of methods we're gonna look at to kind of describe how enzymes function. And we're gonna look at the different ways with which it functions by uh, specific types of models. So the lock and key versus induced fit model is something that we'll talk about quite often. With regards to lock and key, uh, it's important that we realize that the protein or the activation or the enzyme, it's gonna fit into a specific reactant that fits perfectly into that enzyme. So the enzyme and substrate are rigid, they do not change shape. So that's like, uh, imagine you were to put a lock into a key, there's only one lock for that one key, and no other key will be able to open that lock, and no other uh, lock can be opened with that key. It is a one-to-one, -one, one one-to-one ratio, lock and key, enzyme, substrate are so rigid, cannot change shape. So that's the lock and key. The induced fit model is a little bit different, because we're looking at it in terms of uh, how that enzyme is gonna function. So the induced fit model basically says that, well, when the substrate binds to that activation site, the enzyme can then change its shape. And as a result of that, it brings the substrate closer or reduces that activation energy. So it kind of gives it a nice little hug. So if you wanna think of the lock and key method as like a key and a lock, and the induced fit model is the hug that you all need after spending uh, six and a half hours listening to me talk about proteins and carbohydrates, uh, that's what the induced fit model is looking at. It's looking at that wrapping around of that uh, substrate 
and it's going to bring that activation energy down. And as a result of that, it can fit multiple different substrates regardless of what their shapes are. So in both models, it's important to recognize that the enzyme and substrate specifically, uh, they, they have that specificity. So substrates fit perfectly into an activation site in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's a one-to-one -one ratio fit or it's in, that, um, it, it's in that induced fit model where the enzyme can change its shape a little bit, it's going to be happen it's, there's going to be an enzyme substrate complex. Uh, enzymes will always perform the same reaction over and over again. They do not perform a different reaction. It doesn't break down one thing one day and then another thing another day. It, it only ever breaks down that one specific thing and it only ever performs that one specific reaction. And then changes to the enzyme shape will impact its function. Just like I talked about with denaturing, just like I talked about with all of those primary, secondary, and tertiary structures, if those change, that changes the enzyme shape. And if the enzyme shape changes, the function changes. So let's take a look at enzyme activity, and we'll take a look at step-by-step -step process with which that enzyme activity happens. So to begin with, the enzyme attaches to the reactants, right? That substrate, if you will, at the enzyme's active site or activation site. Every enzyme has a specific reaction that it catalyzes, and this means that it has to fit the substrate perfectly. It's going to have that same shape and same interaction, whether it's the lock and key or whether it's that induced fit model, it's gonna fit that substrate perfectly, okay? Those reactants are gonna fit perfectly into the activation site or active site, and they're gonna help with that interaction. So once that's attached, the enzyme will then change its shape to allow for the reaction to happen. This is known as enzyme substrate complex. That enzyme substrate complex is the formation, it's the formation of essentially a new shape protein or enzyme and the substrate reactants complex, which allows for that reaction to then get catalyzed. So the enzyme and products are attached and they stay attached, albeit for brief, uh, a brief amount of time. This allows for the enzyme to repeat the reaction and it's gonna continue to, to in, increase that or decrease that activation energy until that reaction takes place. So once that reaction takes place, the reactant or substrate is no longer considered a reactant. It becomes the products. And then they leave the activation site or the active site. And then the enzyme, which is not consumed by the reaction, will then to continue catalyzing further reactions. So the key thing here is, is that it will probably produce uh, the reactants many, many, many times. RxN is just reaction. Uh, so it's going to continue to, to, to produce the same reactants, and, and some enzymes perform the reaction 10 million times a second even. So it's, it's incredibly fast, it's incredibly efficient, and it's incredibly uh, energy efficient with regards to those step five steps. Uh, I'll say right now, those five steps are crucial to, to anything that, we're gonna, uh, that I'm going to assess you on. So cofactors and enzymes are, are factors that kind of help enzymes function. So some enzymes require a little bit of additional non-protein components to work properly. So we have two things that we're going to look at, cofactors and coenzymes, okay? Cofactors are going to help the substrate bind to the active site. So sometimes the substrate doesn't want to go into that active site for whatever reason. It, uh, the enzyme's a little too polar, the enzyme's a little too non-polar, a little too hydrophilic, hydrophobic, what have you. Uh, cofactors kind of help coax the substrate into that activation site. Coenzymes, on the other hand, are organic molecules like vitamins that act to help substrates bind. Okay, so the key thing here is that coenzymes are organic molecules, whereas cofactors are not necessarily organic. So when I say organic mo molecules, I mean they could be amino acids. Uh, I mean, they could be polypeptides, they could be carbohydrates, any type of carbon-based organic molecule. In this case, they're usually vitamins. Uh, it helps with that substrate to be bound. So in my diagram here, I have that enzyme. The green is a cofactor or a coenzyme, and it kind of helps that substrate fit into where it needs to fit into. So enzyme activity in different conditions. Uh, this is just looking at how pH, temperature, presence of inhibitor molecules, all of that stuff contribute to how that enzyme works. 
so the first one we're going to look at is that enzyme and substrate concentration. So what this means is that if there's a lot of substrate, as the enzyme increases, so does the rate of reaction. Uh, so all this means is that, oops, all this means is that there, there's going to be excess substrate and the amount of reactions that take place by that enzyme will be proportional to the amount of enzymes there actually are. So the rate of reaction as the y-axis is proportional to the enzyme concentration. The more enzyme there is with excess substrate, the more reactions and the faster it will take place. Uh, a simple linear graph to describe that reaction. Uh, again, it's a linear based re uh, independent dependent variable. We don't want to talk too much more about that in that case. Um, with regards to the enzyme remaining constant, the saturation occurs when all enzymes are being used. So again, in this example, with, with regards to this graph, the amount of enzyme is finite. The amount of excess substrate continues to increase, or there's a ton of excess substrate. The amount or the rate of reaction in that second graph on the right, it's limited by the number of enzymes that there are. So the enzyme substrate concentration really determines uh, how quick the reaction takes place. Where there is unlimited substrate and unlimited enzymes, it will continue to increase linearly. Whereas the substrate concentration is increasing or continues to increase, but the enzyme concentration is set, uh, you'll start to see it taper off uh, logarithmically and it'll create that flat curve, so to speak. So the concentration is the amount of solutes per unit volume. That's all that that's referring to. So another aspect that limits is the available surface area. Um, again, the surface area has an impact because the surfaces of the substrate available to bind to the enzyme uh, strongly dictates how quick that reaction can take place. Uh, imagine grinding food into smaller pieces uh, versus having bigger chunks. So there's going to be huge competition uh, to bind to active sites. So we have enzyme inhibitors that kind of prevent or um, help relieve or help um, reduce the amount of uh, active sites available. And it's interesting to think about these in the context of why we would want to limit how much an enzyme does. Um, because it's, it's important to consider why that would be the case. So the inhibitor blocks part or all of that active site and it prevents that substrate from binding. And as a result of that, inhibitors bind to another location uh, which allow for that change in that active site shape. So there's two ways with which we see enzyme inhibitors. The first is that the inhibitor blocks the active site as a whole. Uh, the second is that that inhibitor binds to what's called an allosteric site, which prevents the shape of the enzyme from accepting any type of substrate. Uh, so again, the reason why these substrates uh, exist or the inhibitors exist, it, it can be many, uh, but ultimately these inhibitors are going to make strong binds, um, str are going to bind strongly to the enzyme. They can bind weakly as well, uh, but mostly for the most part they can bind strongly. So uh, for those of you who are thinking about doing that uh, case study on alcohol consumption and, and whatnot, um, it's important to realize that that alcohol as a concentration, as it increases, uh, it actually inhibits some aspects of the enzyme that breaks it down. So, you know, but you'll find that out in your researches as you go. So if there's a weak interaction, uh, the inhibitor can be lost in the place of a substrate. So it can get kind of bumped out. Uh, so it's reversible. Uh, so as I talked about with regards to that alcohol example, uh, eventually over time, the enzyme will break that down and that inhibitor will no longer be there. So it's a reversible process. However, some inhibitors form covalent bonds uh, with the active site and, or to another site of the enzyme, and it basically creates an irreversible reaction. So that's a toxic uh, reaction. So some poisons, uh, in this case cyanide, uh, refers, uh, sorry, uh, permanently bind to enzymes that are responsible in cellular respiration, which are required for producing energy, uh, and it's an irreversible uh, covalent bond that it forms. And that's why cyanide is poisonous in specific doses. Uh, penicillin is another one that interferes with enzymes needing to make cell walls. Uh, so that's why penicillin is such a functional or effective antibiotic because it permanently binds to the enzymes that are responsible for making cell walls in bacteria. Another way that enzymes, uh, we see regulation is what's called allosteric regulation. Enzymes have that allosteric site, which is able to bind molecules that can change the shape or activate the enzyme. Uh, 
uh, at, in another location. The allosteric regulation can help activate or inhibit enzymes. Uh, so it's not binding directly to that active site, but it will bind to a part of that enzyme. And, and this is what we were talking about with regards to specific enzymes um, that are responsible for digestion. Uh, they have those allosteric sites that are gonna change the shape and how active they are um, with regards to that. Uh, so it's important to recognize the examples. They aren't something you have to memorize specifically, but it is something that you need to understand in the context of how enzymes work. Uh, so when we look at those allosteric sites, uh, it's important to recognize here that allosteric activation and allosteric inhibition is something that the body uses to kind of activate or deactivate enzymes based on specific circumstances. So the activation of an enzyme will change the enzyme shape and allow substrate to bind to it. That's allosteric activation. Allosteric inhibition is that allosteric inhibitor which binds to the enzyme and makes it inactive. So it's just two forms of allosteric uh, uh, activation and inhibition. Uh, it's important to recognize that with regards to control enzymes and their activity, uh, to prevent damage and prevent waste of resources or energy. So it's really important to think of allosteric inhibition and allosteric activation as a means to control the rate with which uh, certain resources are utilized. And, and when we talk about the digestion aspects and how cellular respiration kind of does its thing, you'll start to realize why enzymes need to be turned on and off depending on the presence of certain molecules. Because if it's going full speed all the time, it's not good for some multitude of reasons. But if it's going super slow or not happening at all, that's also bad. So these allosteric inhibitions kind of work to kind of minimize uh, activity or increase activity. Okay, the last thing, I promise the last thing we're gonna learn for today, we're looking at feedback inhibition. Uh, this is the idea that at the end of the day, we're looking at a negative feedback loop. It's a series of reactions that produce an end product, and then that end product negatively feedbacks or acts as an allosteric inhibitor to end the product, um, or to end the reaction pro uh, product of products and, and basically stop that reaction that that enzyme goes through. So that end product acts as an inhibitor, an allosteric inhibitor, and it prevents a waste of resources and excess products being produced. Because once that product reaches a certain concentration, it can bind allosterically and inhibit that protein or that enzyme from functioning. The last thing I wanna talk about is that temperature and pH aspect. We talked a bit about it in terms of digestion. We talked a little bit about it in terms of too hot or too cold. Uh, it changes the shape of a protein, which changes the function of an enzyme, and it changes how that active site is able to bind to things. So if it's too hot or too cold, uh, or too acidic or too um, basic, it, and outside of that enzyme's optimal range, it will denature that protein, which means that the shape will be altered forever and it cannot work efficiently. So the humans optimally perform uh, at a pH of about seven for most enzymes. Some enzymes involved in digestion and, uh, and other aspects need a little bit higher or lower, but for the most part, the average pH of the human body is seven for that reason. And we also function optimally at about 37 degrees centigrade. And these charts here are just kind of looking at the aspects of efficiency with regards to it. So these examples down here are just looking at why temperature and pH impact uh, the function of an enzyme. The enzyme activity happens at different pHs for different enzymes, depending on where they're located. Uh, and like Mike said, my example for pepsin and trypsin in the stomach and small intestine, Pepsin needs that low pH, trypsin needs that high pH. And then peps, uh, pH also affects the hydrogen bonding and it disrupts that secondary and tertiary uh, structure, which then again changes the way that that enzyme behaves. And then when temperatures uh, increase past 37 degrees, the particles, specifically substrate and enzyme, are moving faster, which can increase the frequency of collisions and that prevents proper binding from happening. And then lastly, the increase in temperature also decreases secondary and primary structures. Okay, folks, a lot to digest, I know. Uh, it's a busy day in terms of all the material we covered, but rest assured, the quiz I don't think is as bad as yesterday's quiz in terms of difficulty and length. Uh, so hopefully that makes your lives a little bit easier. Uh, I'll take up some questions now if you have them, and then I'll release the quiz closer to about three o'clock. Okay, folks?